and gentlemen, welcome back to another interview here with none other than Mr. Alex Kuramanis. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here to, to first of all, occupy the slot that many other investors probably should be occupying right now and to have the attention of uh, all of your followers. It's, you sell uh, it's yourself too short, my friend. This is, I'm actually, <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this conversation. I, oh, thank you. I, thank I absolutely you. love talking with you. So I yeah. um, want to give everybody a quick, um, you know, bio on, on, on your story, a little bit about who you are. So mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of go into it. So seven years ago, Alex was a bartender with a philosophy degree, zero experience in business or real estate. Purchased his first burr back in 2013, where he spent a few years renovating, reading, and networking. So after selling his first mm -hmm. property, Alex used the profit to purchase one buy and hold property and one flip. And mm -hmm. today you have 13 units and you're mm -hmm. a full-time wholesaler and multifamily investor with over 20 deals mm -hmm. on your belt. Mm -hmm. And you also have an online course in real estate investing, negotiations, and personal finance on Skillshare and Udemy platforms. And mm -hmm. uh, when you're not thinking about real estate, you love to skateboard, which we were just talking about, and spending yeah. time with his wife, Emma, who's incredibly mm -hmm. lovely, and your dog, like Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, very, very yeah. Nice. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's very, I, I'm, I'm always very inspired by these kind of stories. So I, we're going to mm -hmm. get right into this whole thing because I, I kind of sure. want to break down how it happened. And once mm -hmm. again, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, so for those of you guys who haven't talked to Alex or, or had the, well, Alex Gromanis, because I realized we're both Alex's here, <laughs> but you're, since uh, really getting amalgamated into the, um, into the, the real estate investing network, I've been very grateful to have met a few key individuals who I now hold dear as friends. And you guys happen to be one of those, especially you. I know when, whenever you call and it's just like a one-off question we have for one another, next thing you know, like 40 minutes has gone by and we're like, oh shit, okay, I gotta go in. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that there's few people in this world that you can have a great connection with. And that's why yeah. I think you have an incredible outlook on the real estate industry and, and growth and mindset. And I think that that often is overlooked. And yeah. um, and I was speaking to to Mandy about it on our last interview. And yeah. it's not like the first three chapters in any of the books that you read. But yeah, a, a great outlook on it. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So to, I mean, great, yeah. start us off a little bit here. Uh, let's actually before we even get into your background, COVID. Mm. How, are you, how are you making out? Give us you a know what update. It, it, it definitely uh, presented some challenges. So first of all, like uh, I'm still working, I'm still finishing my uh, 11 unit. Uh, mm -hmm. So that uh, out in Peterborough, first of all, it's tough enough to get like, you know, decent labor. Every, every investor knows that labor is usually just gonna be some point of headache unless you're banging out like, you know, Luke Byron deals of every, like a deal every five minutes and you know, you got all your stuff set up, okay. But like for most people, you know, you're doing a certain, only so much at some times you can't have like regular work for these guys unless you're flipping regularly which i'm not because i'm wholesaling mm -hmm. and uh so that's already a challenge but with covid the, one of the problems is it might not be a problem i guess but one of the problems is because of the serve money a lot of people are you know taking what's called the serve vacation uh where they're you know just hanging out and drinking beers and doing whatever because you know there's no incentive to to go through that risk uh, or you know, maybe they have kids or whatever reason um, you know, that what that would suggest, though, too, is that if these are the people that are taking vacations to drink, then these are people I wouldn't hire anyway. So it actually saves me trouble <laughs> having to put yeah. up with their crap, right? But I know um, a few of those. A couple of those are, are people that I've like grown up with. Like, oh, yeah. how's, how's COVID? It's fantastic. I don't do it. Yeah. I just, <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. And certainly, I, I think that the dynamic for wholesaling has changed, uh, at least for me. Um, I, I don't have. The, the same kind of system set up. Like I don't have like an office building with like 15, 20 staff members. It's pretty much me and a couple other people. And uh, I, I don't quite market to the extent that someone who has that, you know, bigger setup would you know need to because to cover overhead, but also would be able to uh, manage. Um, so what I found is like a lot of the calls I've been getting, they're not people that are really terrified uh, or, you know, like I had a couple of landlords who were like, hey, and I'm not sure where this thing is going. I'd really rather sell. And I start talking with them and then it gets to a point where it's like, okay, well, I'll just list it. You know, like yeah. all of a sudden, you know, you're motivated one second. The next minute you're just like, you know what? You just forget. I'll just list it. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know. I think that the people 
it's weird because usually the types of clients that we will, uh, or not clients, but sellers that we'll work with will be um, uh, people that, you know, have a situation where they just, they got to sell. They don't have the time or the means to go through MLS. So they need someone to bail them out of a bad situation. Um, and I haven't really, I found fewer of those lately. I like, they're still, they're still around, but a little bit tougher. So I, we're, um, we're going through the same thing. And I think yeah. that you kind of mentioned it, that whole curb bonus that everyone's getting is like, Mm -hmm. actually putting a little bit of pressure off of those folks who it could be you know uh, I, I know that there's uh you know it's obviously well some people really really need it and especially in the cases where we're talking about you know distressed yeah. properties people that need yeah. uh sure. you know need to sell quickly mm -hmm. now with a little bit of a bonus maybe they don't need to sell as quickly so i'm sure. gonna i'm wondering what's gonna happen in the next coming months um you know both from a market perspective and from an urgency perspective for sure you know, there's a lot there because uh, I think what COVID has done is sort of uh, like I, I'm tempted to say sober us up, but I mean something a lot more in a lot more philosophical. <laughs> yeah, like like more like it, it, it's really shown us like, hey, you know, the reality of the life, like people that complain about, you know, problems uh, in Canada, it's like, dude you like the rest of the like we're talking about like the jungle where like chimpanzees are ripping off dicks and stuff just for fun like that's what reality is like you're yeah. on vacation and now the vacation is over like yeah. now we actually have a crisis in our generation that we haven't seen in the last hundred years and the thing that's scary for me is because my background obviously in philosophy and cognitive science like i know already how thin the veil is for the difference between utter chaos and what we call civilization doesn't take much for people to go absolutely insane and eat each other, which is why I was a big fan of The Dark Knight because the Joker kind of makes that claim, you know, it turns out he's wrong because the people end up doing things you wouldn't expect. The end, they didn't blow up the prisoners. So it's like, well, that's weird, <laughs> they should have, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, he, he's right to an extent. When, when the chips are down, people will eat each other and we're seeing it. And, and with the, cr the crazy thing too is like, normally, I'm not really a fan of being on Facebook or whatever because your brain is taking it, like the way your, your brain takes in data is it just, it takes in a bunch of crap. It decides what's relevant. Some stuff gets like, there's a theory that everything gets stored away. Like your brain is an infinite resource for, for memory. The problem is you just can't access it all. Mm -hmm. But something in that area is happening where you just get this information, your brain remembers it, but it doesn't remember the source or, or why, but it remembers yeah. the impact, emotional. Right. So you may get some stuff on Facebook that totally warps your worldview. And all of a sudden you're a racist. You're like, well, all lives matter. Or, you know, like, like, dude, no, you got led down the garden path by all these things you keep clicking on and liking. And now you're thinking in a way that you wouldn't normally like, like, man, that alone is a problem. Now with COVID and with riots and with these sentiments about how rent doesn't matter because landlords have a bottomless pit of wealth, but you should pay for groceries. It's just it's like it's all crazy. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? No, you're. you're uh, you're so right and and uh, uh th that's another kind of whole whole can of worms on its own this yeah. whole rent rent strike and stuff i, I don't know if you yeah. uh, saw the one with kayla andre and sarah larby but it's uh oh, i watched some of it i i uh i wanted to watch the replay yeah but it, that... it's uh, it's scary to um to to think about the fact that like we as landlords despite like i i often think that very successful landlords have gotten to where they are and and i see landlords and i'm and i mean people who invest in property housing providers whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. I, I feel like the successful ones have gotten to where they are based on the fact that they have a unique mindset and they've learned mm -hmm. to to overcome the challenges that a lot of people don't even want to entertain facing let alone yeah. you know they get on the first rung of the ladder let alone make it and yeah. um to to have gone through all that psychological, like from the time when I bought my first property, the first one, and I almost threw up because I was so nervous to now oh. I can go into a house and be like, oh, I'll put an offer in, no problem. You know, to mm -hmm. that, that growth to now realize how absolutely powerless we really are yeah. is a scary yeah. thought, right? And so- That's the thin veil again, you see, it's, it's pulled away from you. Like the reality oh. is- Totally, this totally. Is what it looks like, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, needless to say, with, with regards to COVID, your 11 unit building, do you still have tenants in there? Are you kind of working while tenants are turning over? Or how's that working for you? So um, 
we were at about half occupancy. Um, we kind of got pulled in a couple different directions and dealt with some other stuff. So um, we're getting now to the point where we're completing like three units right now. One is for rent. Uh, another one uh, got started. I, I was able to get a tenant out recently that I thought would be impossible to remove. So that was uh, like a blessing. So now we've got that to focus on. But um, what what has happened to me is like all the tenants were able to pay rent. Mm -hmm. But I just like heard actually like last week, one of my tenants, uh, really, really great couple. And I was super excited to have them in the building because I just like like they they kind of fit the vision of the, the building for me. Uh, mm -hmm. They're they're young uh, vegan kids and uh, they have their own restaurant and they're hustlers and they just they just grind it out and they have a fantastic product. They're really bringing something to that area that it that it deserves and uh, and they, they they bring everything they got to it's it's just wonderful to see. But because of COVID, you know they they obviously their restaurant uh, doors are closed. They can only do deliveries and a lot of their bigger ticket items are more complicated and require that restaurant setting. So they're they're selling only a limited amount and uh, it's also like local organic. So prone to spoiling faster. Maybe they don't have any frozen stuff. So yeah, 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 yeah. unfortunately they told me like, Hey, we got to get out by July 1st. We, we, you know, we tried, but we just can't do it. And God bless them for straight up figuring it out and, you know, not trying to hold me hostage for a year or whatever it would take for me to get, because the, they could do that. And while there is a disincentive to that or a deterrent for that, which is that, you burn your landlord and then other landlords are going to find out or it's going to hurt your credit or whatever. Mm -hmm. Reality is, is th this is a time where there's a lot of unknowns. So some people might just be like, hey, you know what? I'll deal with the mess later. I'm living here for rent, rent free for a year because I don't have any options and I want to save all my money or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's troubling. We got lucky with one person on Kishner out of our entire portfolio. They are like, I, I can't do it. And so what they had come mm -hmm. up with is they, they were going to go back and live with their parents. And they yeah. asked if they could use their last month's rent for this month. And we're like, absolutely. Yeah. Whatever we yeah. Oh, and absolutely. That, was, that was about it. So anyway, I want to reel it back a little bit here because, sure. you know, on your bio, you had mentioned, you know, just seven years ago, you were mm. a bartender with a philosophy degree. So let, let's go back to that point in time. Yeah. So while you were going through school, were you, you know, were you exposed to any sort of real estate at that point? Or like, when did you really start reading up on it? The only exposure I had to real estate, I guess, would be uh, my mom because so my parents separated when I was like four. I've got two older brothers and they're obviously like the smart ones. I'm the noisy third one that needs everybody's attention. And you, you call it charismatic, which is nice. But the reality is I'm just I, you know, vie for attention. And Dude, I scream I'm the middle child. Loud. I know exactly what you're going to do. <laughs> well, the middle child is the sweet one. They're the peacekeepers and the ones that are, you know, keeping everything moving and gelling. They're the good ones. I love my, like my middle brother, James or Jim is, uh, he's the man. He's as sweet as can be. And my older brother, Yan, uh, fiercely intellectual. Uh, as we got older or I, I got older, we started disagreeing more. So that's kind of interesting. But um, anyway, I, I derailed a little bit. Um, what, so seven what years ago. Was? Yeah. What's yeah. your exposure to real estate? Your my, mom. My exposure was my mom. So I, I grew up with my mom and she was working full time, you know, trying like when we first moved out, I was like four. She bought uh, a property in Scarborough for like 220 grand. It already had a basement unit kind of set up. Mm -hmm. So uh, she said, you know what? Um, we're gonna rent out the basement, help pay the mortgage, and I'm gonna go work at Toys R Us as a manager, right? Um, she quickly escalated through the uh, corporate chains and eventually became like a logistics manager for, you know, like Ryder, Pure Later, and all these different major companies. And she did really well. She hit six figures, I think, by maybe by the time I was like 13 or 12 or something. So and, that, and eh? she she was an immigrant like she's English and white so definitely have her you know advantages but um, she was a single mom and you know didn't really have much under her belt so she just made it happen she's a she's a dynamo like she's a force to be reckoned with for sure so anyway that's why she became a landlord that was my exposure but um, all I ever saw was just you know crappy tenants and. Um, I didn't really get why my mom was doing it. And I was not really motivated to get into business. My dad was in business as well. So he was a, a hardwood floor, like layer, like he usually just only worked with hard floor for whatever reason. I'm sure he did some laminate here or there, but that was like his specialty, I guess. And uh, he was on his hands and knees all day. And, you know, every time he came home or if I went to visit him, uh, he'd just be too tired to do anything. So mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, business sucks. <laughs> like, and then when I was in high school, you had to take the civics course or whatever take this business course and I'm like, wait, wait a minute. So like 90% of businesses fail. Like what, what, why, why should I try that? That's ridiculous. I'd rather be an employee, make a bunch of money and then live happy. Right? Like that's the yeah. natural conclusion that anyone would draw if you're reasonable. So fast forward, I guess a little bit, we'll get to college. 
what I realized was I had all this money saved because I was bartending. And while I was in school, like, you know, obviously not, I was in school mo like full time taking a lot of a heavy course load, but on weekends and in summers, I like never took time off. I was just working like through the summers, I was either in school and bartending or just bartending like, you know, 12 days a week. <laughs> There's 12 day weeks. That's just one week is 12 days and you double shifts. And, um, I realized, you know, I, by, by the time I got to the end of college, I had like all this cash saved and I just didn't know what to do with it. And it made me think like, hold on a second. Like if I can make this amount of cash now, I don't know what to do with it. All I'm going to keep doing is accumulating money. I don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, everybody looks at the, uh, ING Scotiabank says you're richer than you think. So if I put it away for 1% or whatever, <laughs> yeah, I'll make a million dollars in like 50 years if I start with a trillion, but realistically, yeah. let's, I can't, so I, I didn't know what to do. And when so I you was mean done, you 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 can't save your way to you know being wealthy? Is it, save, that doesn't exist? Kiyosaki says savers <laughs> are losers, and not that I'm really a Kiyosaki sort of um, you know cult follower or anything, but he distills things in very simple statements that you can remember, like that one. And the reason that savers are losers is because obviously we operate with fiat currency. The dollar is not tied to anything stable. It's just whatever we say it is. So yeah. If you have money saved away. And you're earning two percent. Guess what? The rate of inflation historically is somewhere around three and a half, three percent. You're losing money, and you got to pay taxes oh. on it. <laughs> like, right? like depending on what account you got. Look at so. that tidbit of information, folks. Inflation yeah. is more than what you're making, like storing your 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 money in your bank. And you that's might as well uh, keep it under your bed. That, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So um, that's the trap with RSPs is that that's the kind of like uh, conspiracy theory to keep you impoverished by saying, you know, here's how you can invest your money. And that's all that's ever talked about. So this stuff's never talked about. So the way I figured this out was after school's done, I got this cash shape. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I see, uh, uh, I, I've told this story a couple of times, I think, but I see Ben and Jerry's on TV. Uh, and like, I see these people in hairnets churning all this stuff. And I think, man, these assholes are just sitting on the beach smoking dope and coming up with stupid flavors and they're fucking rich. Like, they can't be smarter than me. Like, what are they doing? That Like, like what? I like I want some of that. Why can't I have that? And then um, it just so happened that when I was bartending, there was this guy who used to come in all the time and he had all these books and I would get into arguments all the time. Not arguments, but he would say a little pithy one line. I was like, the only way, one in your way is you and shit like that. And I would just dismantle that because I got a philosophy background, right? So I'm like, nah, whatever. And, um, but then when I was asking that first question, like, you know, how do I become like Ben and Jerry's or how can I get what they got? I realized that uh, the, the self-help material that he was reading was actually giving you the keys. Like they were, and the reason I found that out is because I started reading, he gave me a book. I started reading the book. And- Which book, uh, if you don't know mind asking? I don't know what the first book was. I think it was um, Prospecting with Posture and Confidence, which is a network marketing kind of book. Like it teaches you how to network market effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, you know, this is what I got from it. It was pretty interesting. I got this and that. And then I learned this and I'm trying this now. And it did this result. And when I told that to, to my buddy, his name's Andre, he said, you know something? Like hardly anyone ever does what you just did. I'm like, what? He's like, I gave you a book. You read it. You told me what you learned. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, really? He's like, most people will not do that. And that's just the way it is. So it's like, I start down this path and because I have the background in cognitive science and philosophy, I know that when you have overlap, at least in the sciences, that's an indication that we're onto something because I'm finding it over here. What are you finding? Oh, I'm finding this over here. Oh, it's the same. Oh, what about, yeah, I'm fine. Oh, wow, it's all overlapping. That's what all the books do. They all say the same kind of thing or in the same direction, not plagiarizing because they each have their own thesis, but they all get to the same point. So I'm like, there's something to this. I go to the Rich Dad, Poor Dad free weekend and I listen to this guy, Pip Stelic, go up on stage and the guy's a gangster. He's like, coolest dude just so like i don't know man some people you, if you know people you just see someone you're like oh that's the guy right there or the gal right they just they have the magic mandy brennan is one example you know you guys are an example you're doing the game meetings and you're uh, getting up in front, of, in front of everybody and sharing your knowledge and like that's the guy right there like that's the one who wants to help right so um anyway i get into these courses um and i realize there's a lot of stuff here that most people think are stupid but they don't have any reason for their belief like they can't support their, they, the reason they're thinking that is because they've been brainwashed. I could see it, right? I'm like, look, yep. what this dude just told me, if it's true, first of all, it makes a lot of sense. And if it's true, is the difference between why he's there and you're sitting over here with your arms folded. Yep. Like, try it out. Just try what he's saying. You could be right. Maybe it's a scam. Just try it. So I tried it and it's like, oh, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Wow. funny how that works, eh? Funny how that works.
You know, so, um, going back to your, your book statement there where, uh, where you read a book, have you ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People? Oh, yeah. So that, I, that's a life-changing book. Yeah. So I read that book. I've read it probably like 10 times. Uh, wow. It's, it's beside my bedside. I always just kind of flip through it. But they, I went through like a period in my <laughs> life where I want to like, like send them like, I don't know, an email and order like 50 of those books and be yeah. like a little creepy Christmas elf or something that would stick it <laughs> under people's pillows and not yeah. tell where it came from just because like case in point a book like that like a tidbit of information if you can take it and apply it and it can change your life no different than, than the guy who's standing up the front of the room and saying guys if you guys do this it will change it yeah uh, i i signed up for fortune builders i oh, didn't okay. have yeah. any money to my name yeah. And somehow I was working at Acon at the time. I managed mm -hmm. to pull twenty thousand dollars by liquidating RSPs, credit cards. Like I and the guy had a sweet sales pitch. And what he told me was he said, one deal and you'll pay it back. Yep. And and it was it was the scariest shit ever. I'll be yeah. honest with you. Like every like I didn't didn't tell anybody, like I didn't tell my parents because they'd be just yeah so disappointed that I got into yeah. something. Ponzi scheme, yeah, yeah, and uh, and pre getting into fortune builders, I did a flip, and uh, the partners and I, we just about broke even, and that's what really encouraged me to try and get into this get yeah. systems and understand yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And that next flip, I made more than a year's salary, right? right. And that's amazing. You know, Congrats. One, well, I appreciate it. it was uh, years and years ago, but but that's the yeah. toughest one, the first one. Totally. Well. The first and, one done right. That's and if I wouldn't have sat there and had this guy sit there and say, and, and it's a fine line too, because there's a lot of shysters out there who are like, oh yeah, put this rubbing cream on your head and your baldness will go away. <laughs> like it yeah. doesn't work like that. But don't work like that. Stepping stone of like when when you're surrounding yourself with the right people, and and this is why once again, like networking is such a key factor. You're surrounding yourself with like-minded people, and you're you're bringing in, uh, you know that that osmosis knowledge just by that's being right. in the same room as people. That's right. And that's not even a, that's not even like, that's an understatement. It's just, so there, there's that, you know, the famous uh, line about, you know, uh, who are the five people you spend the most time with? Just take their salaries, average them. That's yours. That's your yeah. salary, right? And it's pretty, so, uh, pretty wild. It's wild, but that's the osmosis that you're referring to, right? Is, and, and I alluded to it earlier when I talked about, you know, how sensitive the brain is to information. You're on Facebook. Like you have to be on guard with what you take in to your to your database because you don't know what can happen with that information. It can corrupt other data. It can be misremembered, and then you pull it out at a party, and someone's actually like an expert, and you look like an asshole. You know what? Like all kinds of crazy things can happen. But you mentioned a couple of things there. Actually, I wanted to drill down on a little bit. Um, I was thinking, not that I have like a whole you know thing prepared, but we were going to touch on um, uh, you know kind of analysis paralysis and getting from having a desire to buy real estate to actually getting up and doing it. So yeah. I think the one of the one of the things that occurred to me the other day was this idea I had of um, like permission. You, when, what what Andre did for me was he gave me permission to believe. Mm -hmm. And my brothers didn't do that because, you know, I love them. And I don't mean any disrespect, but they're both engineers. And if you don't know what an engineer is like, they're pretty like they they're they're, they're pretty no fluff. Just like they're they're very afraid of making mistakes. So engineers. their web of belief. Yeah. <laughs> engineers. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, so, I'm one of them. I know. Trust me. <laughs> so they, they have a, they have a very tight web of beliefs. They don't oh, like allowing wow. in BS. All right. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that we just talked about, because you mentioned lots of shysters in that. And you said you didn't want to tell your parents. You already knew that that stuff sounds bad. So try telling an engineer, hey, you know how everybody gets scanned by these things? Well, this one's not a scan. Trust me. Yeah. You know, like they would not permit it. No one like no one would let me. Do, but I knew I was onto something. And Andre was the one who's like. Yeah, no, I, I read this stuff all the time. It changed my life. And I, I it made me, you know, I don't know if he's rich, but it's brought him a lot of wealth. Right. And he and he just was sharing it, you know, and it's like he just gave me permission to accept this information and investigate it because my brothers would give me a sense that like, well, they're smarter than me. You know, they're engineers after all. And <laughs> and they know and they're older and they're wiser. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't try this thing. But then I've got this other guy who's like, no, no, you should. He gave me permission to just you know, like. Ac academics and I'm a f I'm, I'm a, a big advocate of like you know education and, and learning yeah. and all that kind of stuff but I am also convinced that the system is meant to create employees it's just oh, yeah. you just go in and employee employee next one 
They don't well, who, teach who, that. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, who owns the, the school system or who designed the school system? Oh, well, there you go, right? Actually, I think, if I'm correct, I remember uh, Kiyosaki writing about that, saying that, at least in the States, it was designed by the Rockefellers. <laughs> like, Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, there you go. Makes sense. Someone had to make it. You, you know, like, as I said, I, I'm a big advocate, but I feel like people almost take this, and it's, and it's weird because people know how to work hard during school. Because otherwise, yeah. you know, everyone just flunk out or whatever, or yeah. they have to lower the bar significantly. But it's almost like once they graduate and they get into the workforce, now all of a sudden it, you don't have to try as hard. Now all I have yeah. to do is I have to go to work and do what I have to that's do. That's right. Work to succeed. Turn your brain off. Now yeah. when I get home, I put my feet up, and that's all I have to do, right? That's and right. that's why they coined it, you know, the rat race, where it's just that's you right. work, you come home, you spend money, you work, you come home, you spend, and the the majority of people who i find are, are really inspired by success stories and stuff but aren't able to get their foot into the door of real estate it's it's just the fact that they're just caught up in this constant web and yeah. they don't know where to breach it because it's become such a uh it's become like an everyday thing it's all all of a sudden yeah. they, they've just been in this routine and they don't nothing has to change right and, and then you've had add you know kids to the mix or dogs or car payments or you know in-laws or friends and all this like who's got the time and the energy to to actually live a life let alone live a life and then start a business that's you know risky or that you know yeah. everyone's gonna tell you you're gonna fail at you know that's that's really the thing is like you know again this thing about surrounding yourself with those kinds of people like the key and actually, I've had I've had discussions kind of about like you know education and reading like with with you know again Luke, and uh, telling Luke that you know reading is important is kind of like telling Mozart you should probably go to music school, <laughs> like this guy doesn't need to fucking you know read the like he he's a goddamn genius basically right so <laughs> yeah. of course he tells me no you don't have to read the books so it's like you know I think he would agree that knowledge is important but the reason why you read the books is because again you're kind of conditioning your brain there is a saying something like uh stinking thinking right if you if you if you don't uh if you don't keep your education going you don't keep reading and you don't keep your brain sharp it's kind of like not bathing after a while it, you get stinky right we, we so say we, it's either you're green and growing or you're ripe and rotten so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and yeah. the people who can read but don't are just as effective as the people who can't read right at all sure. like if you if you stop learning you do so at your detriment if you don't have this you know um if you don't have this uh let's say push to be an ongoing like lifelong student then you're just going to go backwards it's just like not working out like you're not working out then all of a sudden you start eating donuts and then all of a sudden you start eating taco bell and donuts and then you know it just gets out of hand really quick let me ask you this do you uh do you believe in the law of attraction yeah um i i know that um that's a tricky one because it's hard to reconcile how do i make the, you know the incorporeal let's say like the, the 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 mind like the thinking into something physical how mm -hmm. does it happen that the brain does that and there's lots of ways in which that happens um it's not really like you just you know pray to god and all of a sudden there's a bag of money next to your bed but yeah. something like that happens it does like it's funny yeah. I'm, I'm a big advocate and, and and i find like so for instance within our team and stuff like that we actually uh back when COVID hit, there was, you know, a lot of uncertainty. So we kind of made, made, you know, told everyone on the team, this is your homework, right, for the weekend. Everyone sit down on Netflix, watch the movie, and then let's come back and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it was funny that, you know, everyone got something out of it. It was, it was positive overall, but a lot of people, and I always have to kind of preface that, like, be careful, like, you know, of what you decide to take out of it because the law of attraction is, is going to work in itself as well. So you yeah. get, you get those people that are like, wow, you know, like it, it's mindset and gratitude and those kind of things and love. But then you get the yeah. people who are like, yeah, okay. So I can just like wish that my bills are gone. <laughs> okay. You know, like it's like, yeah. they don't understand that, that, that entire premise of the law of attraction is what we're talking about. When we're talking about these books, that we now have one small nugget, a takeaway. We yeah. are actually reaffirming that we've learned That's something right. into our brains. And yeah. just that reaffirmation is projecting itself into the universe. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you, you know, I don't believe in luck. I, I don't. I think luck is truly equal parts preparedness and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the people that get lucky 
I know my my mom calls me lucky. I'm like, hey, you seen the whole thing happen right in front <laughs> yeah, of you? Yeah, I know, right? Where's the luck? You like, you know. So well, they have to worry. That's just their job. You well, know. Yeah. It was luck. It's not going to happen all the time. You know? <laughs> yeah, but like right. you know, when you when you consider that the mind is what it will will shift in order for you to get the opportunities. That's it's, right. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. That's that, a, yeah. Totally. Totally. There's, like there's so there's the like within uh, philosophy. I don't want to get too you know boring here, but there's you know philosophy is kind of the main umbrella and then you've got like metaphysics which is like a serious domain within philosophy and metaphysics is broken up into subcategories you've got epistemology ontology uh and um the other one anyway uh epistemology is going to be concerned with what uh, it is that you know and how you know and what the nature of knowledge is all these kinds of things ontology has to do with how things are out there so to speak so if you want to have like an ontological account or, or you know even just say like a scientific account of how um the, the law of attraction works like th you're, you're the whole operation as a human being is just perception so when you tell your brain something to look for you're gonna perceive that oh well, it's everywhere now i see it everywhere it's because yeah you weren't you weren't perceiving it before you didn't give your brain permission or you didn't you think about that and your brain wasn't um let's say warmed up or or set up to look for that so you missed it but now that you have this new information all of a sudden you're perceiving things you didn't see before so it's kind of like in that case, you're not really attracting it. You're just sort of noticing it now. Mm -hmm. And and then there's all of a sudden all this opportunity that you thought was impossible before. Like, it, it's hilarious to me because people tell me things all the time about how Toronto real estate's unaffordable. It's like, what do you mean by, like, what was your plan? Oh, you didn't even have a plan. Well, then that's why it's unaffordable. Yeah. I, you, anybody can buy Toronto real estate. You can have a 10-year plan, a four-year plan, whatever. You can customize it, design it any way you want. And at the end of the day, people are stuck in the fact that, oh, I work at McDonald's. How am I going to do it? Well, if you become an expert in real estate investment and you go out and meet people who have money, you don't need to save a million dollars over 50 years working at McDonald's. You just borrow it, make the profit, make them the profit, and then repeat. Like, you just got to figure out what your thing is and then make it happen. Enough with the, like, when you just say, <laughs> brain, stop thinking. I'm going to work. I'm tired. I, Toronto real estate's unaffordable anyway. Rich people are bad. <laughs> you know, like, then, yeah, you're never, like, you're not, you're going to keep that money away from you at a, at a yeah. very far distance, right? Okay. So, on a synopsis of, analysis process what would be your recommendation you know you meet somebody at a, a networking event and they've been coming for the past three years never bought property but they're in there they're loving what, what would you what would you say to them i think that everybody's situation is unique you can't really give like a one-stop shop that's going to work for everybody everybody has their own so there's a great book called personality plus there's also the like um myers briggs personality um thing Yep. You should go and take that stuff and figure out. So there's the, the, the sage wisdom is know thyself. I think that was Socrates or Shakespeare, whoever. They said, know thyself. And that is such a critical, like everybody's like, of course I know myself. I like hamburgers. I like to poop in the morning. Like I know myself. No, no. you don't know the stuff that you're afraid to look at. Like yeah. there's truth in there that you're keeping from yourself. Just like, you know, an extreme example would be someone who's endured trauma. Sometimes what happens is the brain protects you and you just forget it. Like you black out and then people go through hypnotherapy or whatever and then they uncover it right sometimes they're also planted so dangerous but anyway um when you uh what was i talking about man i just lost myself with that no, uh, every every situation is unique right every situation is so, unique no, so I... the truth stuff the truth so you yeah. don't know stuff about yourself because either it's stuff that you don't want to deal with like it's it's shit that you need to address that you're not doing because you're scared yeah. or you're just blind to it because it's just so natural there's no other way to do it like of course i i keep lists of everything how are you supposed to remember things well i don't keep lists because i i'm a, like i'm a big picture guy i'm not a detail guy i hate looking at lists so i need someone who has lists but like someone who has lists might not see the bigger picture that's what you don't know about yourself so like i can't say okay the only thing you need to do is just make lists because people doing that right now they're not getting any results well what are they lacking well they're lacking maybe action taking or you know, being with someone like you, you said before, I'm charismatic. Maybe they need a partner like me who's like, let's buy it. Let's just let's do it, man. You get the list together. I'll go negotiate a deal. Just whatever. We'll figure it out like yeah. that. That might be all that person needs. Yeah. So my advice would be, first of all, know thyself. You should definitely take the Myers-Briggs test and have a, a spouse or a loved one take one as well and compare sure. your results. And yes. Uh, disc it's is this. A, this is a yeah. great. That's for free. Even better. Yeah, you can go on Tony Robbins' website and get the disc profile. That's that's a great and, point. And yeah. Honestly, like I'm so glad you brought it up. Disc actually changed my life. Like really, fully. fully. How? It just How? helping understand where my strengths really lied. Like yeah. for for right now, I can 
uh, and especially in negotiations, especially in yeah. health. I do believe always in a win-win, no deal. So when I was mm -hmm. working in listings, for example, I need to go into a property. I need to assess what I am and assess what they are and how I can make that work. Because yeah. I know right off the hop, I'm a high I second D. And yeah, I know yeah, what yeah. that means. And some people might not understand, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an extrovert. I'm a little bubbly. Sometimes I can be a little short and straight to the point. Yeah. Sometimes I can be a little bit of a bulldozer. Right. Without. Right. Realizing yeah. it, right? And I find I, it surprising. I don't like, oh, shoot. I, I don't it, get me so fired up there. I knock my own headpiece out. Well, uh, but once again, with, with a lot of awareness with, within, with regards to self-awareness, you can, you can start to work on some of these things. And of course, uh, you know, highlight your strengths, but also, understand that sometimes I got to stop and take a yeah. breather, whatever, you know, explain things thoroughly to people who are looking for direction, but You're 100 right. dealing with sellers or dealing with, uh, you know, potential, whatever, yeah. um, if I'm sitting there and I'm going to be a bulldozer and throw paperwork out and sign here, press hard, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's somebody who needs to understand the process and needs to go That's right. Fully. It's that's, that's so funny. Cause you just pointed out the difference between a melancholy and a cleric. And that's contained in personality plus. So you like, you should get, did I not get, I feel like I give them away to everybody. I don't give you a copy. I no. might not have. So I'll get you a copy next time we're, in, we're together. But um, that's a book everybody has to get. Hmm? A melancholy and a cleric. Yeah. So I, I won't get too far into that, but basically the cleric is this bulldozer type person. And the melancholy is a person who likes to, you know, again, have lists, systems, do research, come at their own conclusions and then come back to you and report what they found. Like they're, they're, they take their time. Like, like Will is actually a cleric melancholy. He's both of those things. Yeah. I'm a cleric sanguine. I think you're probably a cleric sanguine. You might be a cl cleric melancholy. I don't know. I think you're more a cleric sanguine. <laughs> By the way, shout out to Will if he's watching. Best skateboarder in the world. We're big fans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you seen that melon grab he did? Okay, so that park I was telling you about, there's this sketchy ass little hip and he hit that hip with a little melon grab with a wall behind him and the this much landing. He just went for it, just flying over, bam, melon oh. grab. I can't even melon grab. <laughs> even, how the hell you get your hand back there, man? That's I'm not like, flexible enough for that. I love it. Yeah. So coming back to you've done philosophy, your mom's kind of exposed you to a little bit of real estate. Now you've mm. started to read some books. You've mm. got You've gone to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Tell us about kind of your first deal, what kind of happened. And, and then guide yeah. us into how you got into wholesaling. Of all the different possibilities that exist within real estate investing, why wholesaling? Okay. Uh, I first want to address before the advice to people. Okay, know yourself. Um, you know, read all the books. Get on bigger pockets. Network. Because if you just do that, you will be in a different place. It's just inevitable. That's, That's just that. inevitable, but like, there's more to it than that. But if you're at least doing those things, give it a year and don't be a little wuss, like do something. <laughs> Inevitably, you gotta do it. You, it might, you might hurt yourself. That's what skateboarding is about. You hurt yourself. Anyway, so yes, um, mom gives me the, the you know, expectation of real estate a little bit. I get these courses. My first deal was I uh, took, there was like four courses within the Rich Dad Port, I think. I took the first one, which was uh, Master Investor. So that's where I learned about, you know, cap rates, um, like the NOI times 10 kind of rule, um, uh, questions to ask a seller, uh, questions to ask a realtor, um, you know, what kind of income should you be striving for? What kind of like, like it gave me all that bare bones stuff so that I'm like, okay, now at least like I've never, you know, done any renovations before. I've never bought real estate before, but at least I understand kind of the, the goal. Like, like this is, you should be getting this stuff together. Okay. Uh, yeah. So after about like, you know, nine months or so, I'm like reading all these books and I'm getting into self-help, you know, pretty heavy. I'm out of school, so I have a little bit more time I'm just bartending. And uh, I'm I'm like, you know, making calls kind of like on Kijiji ads and just trying different crap and making horrible mistakes, whatever. But after the nine month period, um, I think by six months in, I was looking for, I, I found a realtor and we were looking for property. So it took, took a couple months, I think, two or three months. Uh, we saw like probably 50 properties, like this poor realtor, man, he worked so hard for me. <laughs> Like, man, and that's a shout out to realtor. I'm like, oh man, poor sucker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Dude, it's such a, that career is hard, man. It's oh. hard. You got to hustle like a, like a mofo and, and there's just nastiness and crappy clients and ugh, so much work. Yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. Um, indeed. Yeah. Um, so, so you uh, properties with your real estate agent. Yeah, so we're looking at properties. Eventually, I find one that has like a basement sort of set up mm -hmm. uh, to be a second unit. So um, 
we bought it. Uh, we moved into the basement, obviously. Um, uh, the upstairs didn't need too much. I think we made like a couple changes. I put laundry in there and painted and uh, pretty much just per like kept the rest of it. And then the basement was a little bit more extensive. Um, and we did like an updated kitchen a little bit. I think like, you know, whatever new flooring, a new bathroom, um, you know, whatever. And uh, that that whole thing. So my, my buddy Andre, who gave me the, the books, he works on high end homes in Toronto. So his business was being sort of a trusted person to take care of like houses like he and the man is that he's a man. Like he knows absolutely everything about like properties and construction. The guy is just so he's just so intense, like he knows everything. So I asked him, obviously, OK, I want to do this and this. You know, what should I do? So he helped me out a little bit, told me like a little bit here what to do or whatever. But then most of it was just me figuring it out and trying different stuff and, you know, whatever. Like it's not super. I didn't get into, you know, obviously electrical or plumbing and stuff. Um, I had an electrician deal with that. But just the cosmetic stuff, I was able to figure out. And it was yep. always YouTube, right? Yeah. So that year I spent figuring it out. And what I learned was I really hate doing this crap. Like I've heard some people, they like to do that. And then they look at their work and like, oh, it's amazing. I'm like, good, it's done. <laughs> I will never do this again. I hate this. I'm one so of those guys where I, like, I love renovating. I love <laughs> you it. love it, right? I hate it. Sometimes I, not... I should, like, I'm like, what the hell have I done? Like, I should just sell everything and move to, like, Tahiti and just build huts for people. Yeah, yeah. just I, I told that's actually yeah, that, that's like I mean I get that I understand it. It's just um, I mean for me it just wasn't the way, and I imagine a lot of people that are watching this are are, are like that too, um, because it's it's scary and hard and and whatever. But you know then of course you got crazy guys that like the art side of it, right? So they enjoy it for the process, I guess. But <laughs> anyway, after that was done, I um, I bought a place uh, in Barrie, duplexed it. And uh, the cash I left aside, um, I just uh, I did a f I, I did it like a, a wholesale a couple of wholesales kind of by accident. Um, like my neighbor had a piece of land that was totally useless. I helped you know I I basically assigned it, uh, made like seven k, which was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I was bartending still, right? And I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, I also assigned a rent to own candidate to uh, Jag Properties, so with Alfonso. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I bought this flip uh, with Luke Boren and. Um, I was kind of like, you know, I'm basically at this point where it's like, I could just do flips either with a partner or without, at least if I'm doing a couple of year, it beats bartending. And uh, if I make a mistake, like eventually I'll figure it out. Like, it's a, like if I could just do one, I'll at least cover my bills most likely. Yeah. Like I, Cause I know how to analyze. Right. So that was the stuff that you learned when you took that course. It's like, how do you analyze or what should you look for? And what, you know, and uh, the truth is that's one of the other roadblocks is what you learn in these courses is basically find an impossible deal. Like that's go ahead and find like a 10 cap or go ahead and find a property in Toronto. Instead of paying 500, you pay 200 for it and then you make a profit. It's like, whoa, how the hell do you do Like it's bidding wars. How do you do that? We call so, that those unicorns. And I, unicorns, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Aptly named because they're, they're few and far between. You know, it takes the right kind of circumstances all to line up to find those kinds of deals. And I've done, I feel like, that's the thing too. So again, about this law of attraction thing, like I made things happen that people just say are impossible. Like mm -hmm. I've got a 0% VTB for $700,000. You know, I've, I've done, uh, I bought a property in Toronto for like 400 and whatever K that I was able to assign for, for big money. Like I've, I've done these things and it's because that's what I was looking for or, or because I tracked it, who knows? But a um, little off topic here, going back to the story after the, the, you know, I get the duplex to do the flip. Um, we tried doing like a couple more flips um, and I, quickly realize again, like, not only do I not like doing the work myself, I also don't like managing workers. It's kind of irritating. Um, and um, I think I was looking for, for more flips with, with Luke actually. And uh, Luke had this idea to mail out um, ads. He's basically just like, they do this in America. Like, let's just do it. Or like, I'm, I'm just gonna do it. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm obviously interested uh, in doing direct mail marketing, but I don't really know anything about it. Like, how does that work? So he basically just showed me, it's like, go to, Canada Post, Precision Targeter, and da da da. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, figure that out. And then um, we basically just use the same printer. So like we um, just started printing up these flyers that were handwritten letters, which uh, we we got the idea obviously from like yellow letters, like Michael Quarles and all that stuff yep. from the states. And um, that was it. We just say again. Michael Quarles, he's a beast. He is. He is a like that's the thing, man. Those dudes, like that's to yeah. me what investors supposed to be, right? which is so so daunting. Like, how can you get to that point? 
I'm such a mess. Like I'm lazy, you know, <laughs> like, how do I do it? Right. But I still want it. So, yeah. yeah. So, so how did that, how'd that go? First direct mail campaign. Did the uh, guess phone just start ringing off the hook? Actually it was interesting. Yeah. We, I didn't really get ringing off the hook, but I got like, you know, three or four calls one day and then one call the next day and then like another five calls one day and then nothing for a few days and we mail out again. And then, you know, uh, what we basically were doing in that period was trial and error, like alpha beta testing. So we tried different kind of mailer templates and then we tried different ways of talking to sellers and figuring out like, you know, what, what works and what doesn't. And, you know, pretty much just through trial and error. Um, like that's the thing is you can get all this guru stuff and all the information, but there's really no substitute for experience. You just cannot learn and pain like pain. We were talking about that the other day, right? About pain. Like I, I, I admit, like I, I've read the books and I'm like, okay, I won't make that mistake. And I do it. I just can't yeah. <laughs> just, you end up doing the stupid shit that you know you're not supposed to, but when you lose money, you're like, okay, now I won't do that again. Like now I know a better way. That was stupid. Yeah. So pain is a good teacher and experience is an excellent teacher. And, um, what we what we did was just trial and error with these different flyers, and uh, we found eventually that um, you're really just looking for a certain um, series of things to line up. And when you find that in a call, then that's that's when you take action on, because you're gonna get like you know X number of calls, and everybody wants you to come see their property because that's the hilarious thing. I get so many calls, and people are like, "Oh, you have to see it," because when you see it, then it'll be worth more than what it actually is worth more or worth. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. All I have to do is look at it, and then all of a sudden I'll be a millionaire, right? Like I don't have to do anything. Okay, but no, I know what your property's worth. I don't care about the banister. I don't care about the tile. Like I <laughs> like I know what it's worth. I don't even need to see it, but I'll entertain. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is what I can. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I literally had a half an hour conversation this morning with a guy who was telling me the benefits of a corner lot, and I was like, <laughs> I sir, I, I appreciate that. This yeah. is my offer, but the corner lot is so good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I, even today, I was at a property today in Toronto, and uh, it's actually kind of a sweet deal. So I might, I might get this one together. But it's not really like the, the there's a VTB portion that's sweet. The price is not sweet, but I'll try and work that out with him. But anyway, um, the way the lot is carved up is so weird. It's kind of like a P, right? So the P part is like the main lot. So it's 19 by 97. But then mm -hmm. on the tail part of the P, it's 10 feet wide by 30 foot deep. So he used to be a bank manager at TD, and he goes. Well, the value of this thing is three hundred thousand dollars. Like that, that part of the lot right there is worth three hundred thousand dollars. And I'm like, not if no one wants to develop it. <laughs> like, you know, like it's not worth anything. Like, yeah. I don't want to buy this property and then go through the crazy nightmare of trying to build a ten foot wide whatever residence when I could just buy another deal. Like, what? I don't. That's not. It's not. It's worthless to me. Mm -hmm. The guy said he's like, it's got four four parking spaces. Not really. You've got the garage and then you've got three other parking spaces in tandem. That's really two at best. Like. Like, what do you, it's not four parking spaces. Like, the, the, yeah, the people will, I mean, sellers will always over-evaluate or uh, overvalue their property because it's theirs and they put a lot of work into it. So they think it's worth more. I totally get that, but it's not. So <laughs> you have to like gently tell them, hey, listen, that's fantastic. This is what I can afford. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't like it. Okay, what didn't you like about it? Okay, we can get rid of that. And what about this? Good? Okay, perfect. Now we have a deal. Or no good? Okay, good luck. List it. Yeah, 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 for Simple. sure. So uh, in terms of wholesale type deal criteria, when you're buying properties, mm -hmm. are you typically like, I, I know like for, even in my mind, I'm a, I'm a construction guy. That's my background. So I'm looking for more distressed type properties. Yeah. It's things that I can, I can appreciate the value of it. Um, but what kind of criteria do you mainly look for? I mean, urgency is the easy one, but like, is there a specific type of home you really like? I think that distressed is two components. You can have a distressed property and you can have a distressed seller. Yeah. If you have both, then you've got probably one hell of a deal. Yeah. So um, what I will say is this, like when I'm on the phone within like five seconds, I probably know I have a deal or not. And That's the right. criteria for me is usually not so much um, like what they say, but how they're saying it. It lets me know what kind of a person they are, right? Like, oh, this is a person who is afraid that this is going to happen and they're already in this situation. So they're, they're probably more likely to hear me out because you know what, like I can know someone who gives me like orders in the beginning, like this is what I want and I want it on this day and whatever, like that's not a person I'm gonna deal with. Like that's too much ha hassle, like go list, man. He's not yeah. like, he's not, and, and if I go to a property and it's not an absolute ruins, that's not necessarily a bad thing because the person's life might be in absolute ruins and they don't really have much option. Like I, there was 
uh, well, well, so there was one deal that I had where um, the seller's husband was like an ex-convict, right? And he uh, apparently was a little bit difficult with like um, child support payments. Um, I, and I met him and he, he seemed like a good natured person. Like he um, seems like a decent guy, but he's just prone to anger, right? Like his issue is that he just doesn't have that control. And actually there's a reason for that it has to do with your neurons, like the length of the tails of certain neurons or some shit like that. I don't know, it's wild, but anyway. Um, her situation was she's got like four girls and one of them is going to college, but that's a lot of people to take care of. And they have like 50 pets and her income is enough to afford that stuff, but not to afford, you know, obviously this not having this husband be reliable or whatever. And um, the property was not like distressed, but it was um, tough to show. And uh, there was, you know, a need to work. All right. Like, like it wasn't just like horrible, but you needed to update it, right? So uh, in this situation, I was just focused more on the fact that the seller was like, hey, you know, I gotta get out of here and find another situation. This isn't working for me and I'm stressed out and like, this is what I need. And uh, that was it. It was it was like, it's more complicated than that. You have to get to that point. But basically it was like you said, I'm just figuring out who this person is. I know who I am. I'm saying this, she's saying that, okay, are we here? Then that's what you need. Okay, then, then let's do that. Cause I can afford that and you can afford that. Everybody wins, right? 100%. You know, yeah. people often often think that like, you know, wholesaling has this negative, like, you know, you're trying to rip people off or anything like that. And, you know, I look at, at the people we've helped sell their house. Yeah. And I would give any person who would object that their phone number, say, go ahead and call these people. Cause I would stand yeah. by them. these people are so grateful when you help them out and you kind of set a series of events of what needs to happen. You help guide them through that process. That's right. It you brings get them out of a, home. a tremendous amount of relief. And yeah. there's there's a cost associated with that, right? Yeah. It's, it's they, the way it is. There's simply, like, here's the thing that most, you know, realtors, I think, who, and no offense, because obviously you're a realtor, but realtors who are, you know, against wholesalers. Um, and by the way, there's good and bad in, in everything, right? Uh, oh. But the the one like the, the the depiction they give of human beings is actually kind of offensive. They seem to think that, like, everybody's just stupid. And if you just ask for a reduction, they'll just give it to you. It's like my challenge would be you go out with a contract and show me how you can buy it. Go to that house right there and buy it half off. Go ahead. Show me. <laughs> it doesn't work. That, like I'm looking for the 5% like or fewer. Like they're mm -hmm. so sparse, yeah. but they're just in a situation where they're like, you know what? I don't even sometimes I would say probably 50% of the time, if not 70% of the time, the sellers just don't care. They're like, you know what? That works for me. Yeah. Like I, I they, they know you. They're like, yeah, I know I can make more. I don't want to deal with it. I got other stuff I got to do. Just get me out of here. I don't care. And it's like, well, okay. Or, all right. In my contracts, I actually write that. Like I have it in my contract. Cause of course, like when I'm buying a property personally for myself, I'm obviously full disclosure. They know that, you know, I am licensed. I have all this. Yeah. But I also write down there and make sure that, okay, do you guys have family or anybody else that you would like to run this by first and foremost? Yeah. Day. sometimes they've actually called their you know uncle or whatever to talk it through with them and we go on speakerphone the other thing is that i completely disclose that my intention is to buy this property add capital and by adding capital the value of the property will be worth more yeah exactly. and that if they actually list it on the market they could likely get more so yeah. i mean one of the negatives of getting a real estate license when you want to buy properties you got to disclose the shit of everything but that's right we got to do that and still these people knowingly full well will say i, I just want to get this done just yeah to get out of this situation I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the thing about family i actually don't have a habit really of offering you know like let's call your family and see what they think i don't do that but i do say you know if there's like any reservation or like i feel like they maybe feel like they're being rushed or whatever I said hey because that's the thing that's the other thing too is again this personality type the melancholy let's say they're gonna need some time they want to do the research so what I say is, hey, let's have your lawyer look at the deal, okay? I'll give you, you know, a day, two days, whatever, on this time. And if they say that this deal isn't good or whatever, then we just, it's null and void. It's not a problem. Yep. So the review the deal, the lawyer might want to change a couple of clauses or whatever. And, you know, at the end of the day, the lawyer is like, okay, so you understand that this is a private deal. You know, you could list it. You could do whatever. You want to do this and you, you accept these terms is what they mean. Okay. Right? It's like, okay, so you had someone look it over. We're not duping anybody. I'm not afraid. Like, and I, the, most of the time, like people know what their val the value of the property is. No one has a property. Just like, I don't know what it's worth. 
It's like, okay, so it's worth a dollar then? Everybody has the internet nowadays. So. Yeah, that's right. And so <laughs> everybody has an idea that if they're, if they're giving it over to me at a discount, I'm giving them the value that they're not getting by going to MLS. It's as simple as that. I'm not going around with a gun putting in their head, you know? <laughs> for anyway. sure, for sure. So I know we're getting a, a little bit short on time. Oh, man. Um, oh, look at that. But let me ask you, how do you typically evaluate properties? Because I know you buy properties just about all over the place, right? Yeah. So Peter, it depends. Oh, Hamilton. So yeah. how, how do you know? How do you know, like, when you're looking at a property, if there's going to be enough meat for, the, for you as a wholesaler to be able to profit from that? So I don't usually drill down to like exact numbers. What I do is I have an idea of what a property is worth in an area by, you know, sometimes you can go on like realtor.ca to look at what's available for sale. That's not going to be what you base your numbers on, but that gives you a sense of, okay, so this is what properties are listing for. Um, that one, that one's gone already or whatever. Okay. That gives you an idea. Obviously talking to realtors is key. That's part of your network. Um, you want to get comps. Um, if you're looking at a property in a certain area, you call the agent for that city, you get them to bring you comps and then you know, okay, so this is what properties are selling for in this area. Therefore, um, like I usually try to target, what's the math? I usually just plug it into a, a flipping calculator or whatever, but something roughly like you take the after repair value um, and you have, I guess, uh, I think you subtract the renovation costs. So if you like normally to do just a single family home, you're somewhere between like 40 and 60K, obviously, depending on the condition of the property, the size of the property, the contractors, da, 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 da. So I'll say, okay, the after repair value is gonna be 500K. So I'll reduce that by, you know, uh, you could do a 20% reduction, get it down to 400, then reduce your renovation cost. That gets you down to 340. I know I gotta buy a 340. Mm -hmm. Simple that's math. That's if it. I'm doing if I'm doing commercial stuff, multifamily stuff, that's different. I don't drill. I don't look like it's hard because you don't really have the same kind of comps. So really, what you do is the cap rate math. Um, you'll 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 sort of like with this after repair value thing. Um, you'll know that the market cap. So you. Well, man, there's a lot to put in a couple minutes, but basically you find out what the market cap is, talk to a realtor or, you know, get a sense for what other properties are producing and are being sold for, what, what kind of you know revenue they're producing. You find out the cap rate, you, um, geez, I, I don't want to rush through this, I'm going to lose myself. So yeah, we, we can go over. There's not like, it doesn't stop after an hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so um, I was looking at this property in Toronto, right? And I'm like, okay, how do I evaluate? So this one's tricky because it's actually a four unit in a semi-detached. It's not a commercial building. So there's a different criteria there. But roughly speaking, to determine what this property could be worth to me, I'm going to look at um, what the rents are going to be like once I have that building done. So let's say it's $2,500 a unit times four. That gives me 10 grand, right? 10 grand uh, times 12 is going to be 120000 And then I'm anticipating, you know, like I'm, I put my 2500 as all utilities are included. So... My utility cost at that rent rate roughly going to be 30%, something like that. All my expenses, utilities, all that junk. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got obviously your, your, your mortgage. But when you take away your expenses from that uh, gross rent of 120, that puts you at like, let's say, you know, 80 or whatever it is. And uh, you uh, divide that $80,000 by what the market cap rate is. So in Toronto, it, like the, lo the lower you, you – okay. So first of all, cap rate, mm -hmm. your net income over your purchase price gives you the cap rate of a given property. Yep. Properties that produce the kind of income that sell at the kind of prices are going to have an average of that cap in that area. And that's how they're performing for that area. So for Toronto, there's obviously different kinds of pockets and there's going to be like the, the best of the best. There's going to be kind of okay. There's going to be gentrifying areas, going to be complete crap. There's going to be all that stuff. Roughly speaking, you're somewhere around three, three point five percent for for a market cap for Toronto. It can be even lower. It could be like two percent, obviously, right? But for the viewers, how do you find out a cap rate? What would you do to find it? Uh, well, probably the best way to do it would be to talk to brokers, um, mortgage brokers, realtors, because they're the ones that are actively looking at all the deals that are going by. Mm -hmm. What happens is when you actually try and pull like solds. There's not going to be enough data typically to draw from because the multifamilies are going to be different. Like some are going to be box purpose built. Some are going to be townhouse conversions. Some are going to be like whatever, different kind of thing. You're not really going to get too accurate there. But if you talk with someone who kind of has their finger on the pulse, that's usually the quickest way. You can also go on, I think, like uh, what's the uh, commercial real estate board? Uh, <laughs> I think I just said it. CREB. They yeah. have their like... Um, uh, reports um, where you can, they, they have market cap calculations in there. Um, so you can just go on like CERB, uh, you know, market reports, they have quarterly reports and I think annual reports and all this kind of stuff. You can go there. I really don't pay too much attention to that, but I'm just sort of saying 
you you would just arrive at some sort of market cap. You can even just guess it, really. But like, the, the yeah. reality what is, I, for for actually running the numbers, I mean, we could do an entire segment on on running. You know, how do you find your net operating income, and then your mm -hmm. you know what what, it, what yeah it down to, but understanding these fundamental concepts and basically being able to de determine value, I think is, is the key when, when it comes to, to wholesaling, understanding what you can walk away with, right? Well, yeah. Well, so in the cases, like when I do the wholesale deal, um, I'm looking at what kind of a value am I giving my seller that they can't get on MLS? Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes it'll be, you know, flips. So it'll just be a simple, you know, price reduction. It's like 10% cheaper or whatever. Um, other times if it's like, you know, a multifamily deal, it's like, Hey, I negotiated a deal that has a 50% VTB in second position at 3% for five years. So that's something that like, you know, most agents aren't going to do that work for you. They're just like, Hey, here's a property listed and it's in Toronto. So they're gonna have a million offers, put in your best offer. Like yeah. I can offer something that realtors can't because they don't have the access to the deals that I do. They're not doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So the way I, so if I'm going back to this analogy with the, the cap rate thing, I decide the value is going to be you know, eighty thousand dollars is my net. I divide that by that 035 percent, and that's what my um, after repair value is, roughly speaking, for that multifamily building. The thing is, is that when it comes to properties, like at the four to five mark, five begins to transition to commercial. There's a different evaluation and different criteria for for those kinds of properties. When you're at the four and below, you're still within that residential, um, you know, climate, which you know you're not in your head because you know how that works. Yeah. Basically, less than four, you run off comps. Greater yeah. than five, you run off the income, right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. Key thing for you guys, folks, because over five, it's another thing too. <clears throat> we're we're dealing with it now is that we're, uh, you know, obviously ourselves because we own enough properties now. Like the banks don't like us very much, right? So yeah, on the residential side, they, you know, everything looks great, but on our ratios, when they plug in all their all their details, you know, we're out of whack. So yeah. commercial is a good alternative to that because once you get into the higher caliber, and that's kind of what I feel the trajectory ends up being anyways, you get it, you know, once you've done a few, it's kind of yeah. a good transition to step into commercial real estate. Yeah. Um, they don't look at, at you as much as, okay, a little bit of your experience and, and, and you know, what, what you look like. More so, how does the property, uh, how does yeah. the property carry itself? Perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and what your plan is with the property and they'll actually listen to your pitch and, and understand it. So very, very cool. I want to actually um, uh, not necessarily challenge you, but but give you a counter on what you said before about this. What is more or less a natural progression. You know, you get these single family homes, convert to duplexes, maybe drive a triplex, fourplex, whatever. Then you go into like a 10 unit, 20 unit, 50 unit, whatever, right? What I heard once that was pretty interesting was, again, you know, Kiyosaki is talking with uh, one of these kids he trained once. And the kid's like, um, you know, I got like, I don't know, I got this problem. Like, should I be buying commercial real estate? And Kiyosaki's like, well, what are you buying right now? He's like, well, I've got 50, you know, detached homes and they're all duplexed. And like, I don't know, I should go into commercial. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. you're doing good with, <laughs> don't go to commercial. You clearly, like you're doing excellent with that. Like just stick with duplexes or, or triplexes. Because yeah. there's, there's advantage of that too. And, and you actually don't have to challenge me on that. I, I agree with that. Yeah. If, if you're doing something and you enjoy it and you've got a good process, like real estate doesn't always have to be really exciting. Just understand that. Yeah. If you're bored and you're making money. That's okay. Just it's probably good. Very, very, very well. For me, yeah. actually, like I'm very fascinated and I, and I love the idea of multifamily. And so for me, that's part of my goal is to, to reach into higher. Like we've got an eight unit right now that we're renovating and it's incredible. Uh, like I'm, I'm getting a lot out of it and it's kind of, mm. it's taking that next part of my brain and, and it's totally. and it a little bit bigger and it's, yeah. It's giving me a little bit more to kind of chew on, you know, Yeah. in the middle of the night at 1 a.m. when I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. I know the sleepless nights are the waking up in the middle like, oh, I forgot to. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, like, did yeah. I my property tax? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the series actually happened. I was like, yeah. I was like, I woke up one morning. I'm like, shit, I haven't gotten a property tax bill for like a month. Where, where is that? Or not for a month, but it's a month late. Like, where yeah. is that thing? I got to call the city. Oh, we sent it over here. We didn't get it from there. Like, ah, yeah. you got to remember so much. And that's the, like, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about how to be this perfect real estate investor before you go out and buy a 10 unit building. Like I, I, I did it like try, do it just like, you know, <laughs> have knowledge, be with the right people, have the right team because they will carry you through the, the idiot mistakes you're going to make naturally. Yeah. Um, but doing it is the thing. And I think it ties back to like skateboarding for me, which, you know, you, you can relate to too. 
there's nothing like eating shit. It's just when you when you just absolutely die on a trick, you know, you're like, okay, well, that's the worst that can happen. Yep. I'm still alive. I'll just give it another go. And then it's that first try and that time that you eat shit that it lets you know what you're capable of. You know, I did, like I'm still here. I'm still gonna you do it again. So eating shit means that you wipe oh. out. <laughs> Clarity. Don't actually go eat now. We got enough COVID issues. You don't need to have like dysentery. Yeah. But so. you're right. Once you've uh, once you get burned and you realize that you know what, I'm still standing. I'm okay. And it applies to just about everything in, in, in life. I think is that Absolutely. people fear this, like what's going to happen. And then yeah. it, it's it, and what I feel, and this is once again, we could probably talk about this for another hour in itself. Absolutely. Is that Easy. this uh, you know this millennial age group that has never been known to fail because failure doesn't mm. mean because everyone gets a participation ribbon and we don't keep score and these kind of things yeah. this is where I, when life hits you and you fail that's where that's where i think problems arise so i'm a big advocate of like feel feel quickly feel hard and get yeah. up and it's not you know you're not judged based on if you fail or not if, if you you know if my kid fails one day um it's you know, not walking yet, but that's okay. It's yeah. the non-willingness to get up again afterwards. That's yes. the problem will rise. And that's where you it's can't this, give up. People feel like, you know, you can never be ready. And the reality is you will never be ready. There's yeah. too much to know. You, you're not smart enough. <laughs> you're not talented enough. You just, you just forget it, but buy it anyway. And don't go bankrupt. <laughs> like, make sure you make sure you buy in a way that you don't go bankrupt, and you'll figure it all out eventually. I love I it. Know, it's like yeah, the wisest words. And that being said, I think uh, this <laughs> yeah. is kind of a perfect time to end it. So, with one yeah. last thing, any piece of advice you'd like to, uh, other than you know, buy it and don't go bankrupt, you'd like to leave us with? Yeah. Hmm. Um. Oh boy, that's a tough one. One piece of advice. I guess it would be um, probably, again, a lesser known feature, which is the social aspect of real estate. Going out to, you know, like the game meetings, going out to the right club meetings, going out to Luke's meetings in Toronto, you should be regularly networking. And I'm not saying go hand out cards and go ask people to pick their brain and take them for coffee and all that crap. No one wants that crap, that's lame be interesting, find out something that you can offer someone and go find out who that person is and meet friends like Alex and like we're kind people, hang out with us, talk with us and whatever because that right there is again, like everything hinges on belief and perception. You don't need the real thing. You just need the belief and the perception and everything else will follow. By having this network behind you and being with regular investors, you're telling like, oh man, I had this crappy tenant or, oh man, I lost 20 grand on this one flip one time or this was funny, I did this. And like when you see that that's just a normalcy and that everybody makes mistakes and that people will succeed because they keep pushing, that just, that's a whole other level that lifts you that you can't, you cannot get there by yourself sitting in your chair thinking and doing nothing. You gotta at least go out and meet people and get those juices flowing and find the right kind of person you need maybe to get you the next level. Not necessarily a mentor, but a partner that has something that you lack in. Anything, just something. You just came out, up with that off the spur of your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's just experience. It's what we learned. It's yeah. what witnessed, right? So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for you know, taking thank you. time to chat with me. Uh, this The difference is, is now it's actually being recorded, but I know you and I have not <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. But honestly, I um, I am very grateful. I know Kaylee feels the same way that you know. Whenever we meet you, it's always we're very excited. And you're you're uh, actually it's funny. We were talking with Will and Ali, and Will's the guy we mentioned that, with the skateboarding. Mm -hmm. But um, just the sweetest, sweetest couple in the world. And, and yeah. we were talking about you and how you hold yourself when, when we see you at networking meetings. And it's always <laughs> it's never a handshake with you. It's a big old bear hug. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, yeah. Uh, changes the the relationship and 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 once yeah. again i've always enjoyed our conversation i think you're a wealth of knowledge and uh and truly blessed to have you in our lives so thank you so much for very, spending some time with us very kind thank you very much for the kind words and for the encouragement for being a friend too and uh for giving me the opportunity to to ramble on here for an hour and hopefully some some good stuff came out of it it's uh absolutely yeah pleasure all right ciao see you guys <laughs>